Hello and welcome to another Rygate Maths video on functions and graphs for the A-level maths syllabus. This video is focusing on inverse functions. Now hopefully these are somewhat familiar to you already having used some inverse functions but effectively what we're talking about are functions that undo other functions. In general if a function f of x exists then the inverse function is such that if you combine it with the function f in any way so whether it's composite like this or like that you get the result x where you started the notation for the inverse function is f to the minus 1 which should be familiar given you have probably used inverse trig functions before it's the same style of notation a function with a minus 1 so let's look at these a little bit in practice Let's start by thinking about the function y equals e to the x, or f of x equals e to the x. Hopefully you already can spot what the inverse function will be, but let's for the moment let's talk about the range and domain of this e to the x. So the domain is x is any real number. Just for the sake of this, let's draw the graph. of y equals e to the x. Looks something like that. Okay, goes through 1. So we can see the range is f of x is greater than 0. But what about the inverse function? What function exists so that if we combine it in any order with this e to the x we just get x. Well if you said the inverse function is natural log of x you'd be correct. Let's think about the graph of this. So hopefully you already know what the graph of log x looks like. If you don't it looks like this. crossing at 1. So let's use this to look at the range and domain. The domain, remember, is all of the possible x values. We can see that its own, this graph only exists when x is positive. But we can see we can get any y values out. Let's look at this relationship between a function and its inverse. We can see here the domain and range of e to the x are well, x is any real number and f of x is greater than 0. The domain and range of natural log of x, we've got x is greater than 0, f, of x, f inverse of x is a real number. So maybe you can already spot a relationship between these two. Notice how this bit is the same here and this bit is the same here. That is always true of inverse functions, but why? Well it all stems from the graph. Looking at these two graphs, what's the transformation that's going to get from one to the other? It's a reflection in y equals x. So what does this transformation actually do? Well, it takes the x-coordinate of a point here and the y-coordinate of a point here and it swaps them over. So this point will map to maybe this point 
let's say this is the point 1, E. This point will have coordinates E1. The coordinates have swapped over. And that's why the range and domain swap over as well. Something very important about these two functions in addition to the relationship between the two is that they are both one-to-one. -one. These are one-to-one. -one. For any other type of mapping to have an inverse, we need to restrict the domain to make it one-to-one. -one. So this will be relevant later on when we, if you think about quadratic functions, because you know that quadratics can be undone by square rooting and that kind of thing. But in order to have the answer as a function, we need to restrict that domain. So we're going to have a look at this example here to show you how to lay out your answer to finding the inverse of a function. We can see this is a one-to-one -one function. We've restricted the domain, so it is a function, so it works. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the inverse. So, in order to make our notation and the working nice, the first thing we always do is we replace f of x with y. You don't, strictly speaking, need to do this, but it just helps, it helps the notation. Now, we know the transformation to get from the function to its inverse is we reflect in y equals x. And then what effect does this have on the function? Well, we swap the x and y. Notice at this point we're not rearranging. We literally swap them over. So these are kind of the first two steps. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this function and we're going to rearrange it to make y the subject. And how you kind of rearrange that is entirely up to you, provided you do it correctly. So I'm going to do it this way. This function is equivalent to 3 plus x all over x. It's the same thing. So now we've rearranged. This is now the inverse function. So we get that. So this is the inverse function. And it's relatively easy to find if you follow these steps. It's always replace f of x with y, swap the x and y over, rearrange to make y the subject. How you do that, and kind of that's where the difficulty lies, is this section. The rest of it is just learning steps. Stating the range and domain of this function, well, the range is the easiest one to do. Because remember, the range of this is the same as the domain here. We just need to change our notation. So our range is that f of x, or f inverse of x, is a real number provided that is not equal to 1. It's exactly the same as this, just the x's swapped to f inverses. The domain we're going to need to figure out. But we can see here, we've got a 3 over x, x then in the denominator. What can't x be? x can't be 0. And that's range and domain of inverse functions. Once you get your head around that, it's relatively easy to find. So this is a second example we're going to work through together. Finding f inverse when f of x is x squared minus 3. So, same process again, let y equal f of x, and then inverse is when x equals y squared minus 3. Rearranging, y squared equals x plus 3. Now we get to the difficult part, because we know what happens when we square root. We need to have plus or minus. However, the inverse function is a function plus or minus means it's not a function. But we know that the range of 
f inverse is going to be the same as the domain here. The domain here is that x is greater than or equal to 0. So the range here is y is greater than or equal to 0. So we can ignore the plus or minus. If this was the other way around, then we'd have minus the square root, and that would also be fine. Last thing to do, we've been told to find f inverse, so let's write it down. And we need to state, it, state the range. We, once you define a function, you should always state the range and domain if you're not told to in a later question. Okay, so that'll be part B, and we'll get there. So you can see in this part B, we've been told to write the domain and range of the function, so we don't need to define them here. Strictly speaking, you should, but often sketching the graph makes it easier to figure things out. So this is, if you know the graph of square root of x, this is actually a very straightforward question. So we can think of this as a transformation minus 3, 0. So it's going to move the y equals square root x graph that way, 3. And we're going to get something that vaguely looks like this. Stating its domain and range, we can see the domain, the lowest value in the x direction is minus 3. So the domain is x is greater than or equal to minus 3. The range is this f of x, or f inverse, is greater than or equal to 0. Now part C, we're going to add to this graph a little bit, and we'll see how we get on. Um, I'm actually going to redraw it on my next page. So part C, we're going to solve f of x equals f inverse of x. So I've redrawn f inverse here because, don't forget, when we're solving an equation, what you're doing is you're finding the point of intersection between two graphs. So, if we think about the transformations, this is y equals x. Because this graph intersects y equals x, when we reflect it, the original graph is going to intersect there as well. Now, I know I've not drawn it particularly nicely, but it evidences the point. So, solving this equation is equivalent to solving this equation, because we can see that the two graphs intersect on y equals x, which means the graph intersects y equals x. It also means that it's equivalent to that equation as well, so whichever you prefer to solve, you can go for it. But given that our f equation didn't have a square root in, let's start with that because it's a bit easier. So. Rearranging, we get that. Now, we can see, hopefully, this isn't going to factorise. doesn't mean there's no solutions, We but we just have to pay attention to it. Solving this equation, you can just use your calculator, or complete the square, or use the quadratic formula if you like. So, we've got menu, down to equation... This is a polynomial, it's degree 2, so we've got 1 minus 3, sorry, minus 1 minus 3. And we solve it and we get our two solutions, so we need to write them both down. So 1 plus or minus root 13 over 2. But we can see we've only got one point of intersection. 
So which one is it? Well, we can see that they intersect when x is positive. Also, we know the domain of one of the functions is x has got to be, or for the, the domain of f, x has to be greater than or equal to 0. So we can see there, this, whatever we write down as our final solution, has to work for both domains. So x has to be positive. So we know x is 1 plus root 13 over 2 because it's got to be a positive number. This is a much, much easier way of solving this equation than trying to set them equal to each other and crunching through some relatively unpleasant algebra. That's kind of the, print, the core principles of inverse functions. Go away and practice, and thank you for watching.